I do extend a very warm welcome to you all to this uh, parliamentary covenant service, which of course would normally be in the chapel of St. Mary Undercroft, uh, at the Palace of Westminster itself. But unfortunately, this year, we weren't permitted to hold it there, so we decided that we wouldn't abandon it or go online. We would have the service here at Methodist Central Hall, Westminster. Sadly, Cat Smith MP, who has put a lot of work in with me to put this service together and who invited her colleagues, has gone down with COVID and hoped to be free uh, today, but she's just really not up to it. And she is devastated she can't be here. And she sends her greetings. And I'm going to read a few words from her a little later in the service. However, we do welcome other members of Parliament who are here with us. Um, first of all, I'll give the apology. Emma Hardy MP, who was up until an hour or so ago going to be reading the first lesson, has been held up in a debate in the House. But we're delighted that Stephen Timms uh, MP is going to read her lesson for us. So we're thrilled to bits. So thank you very much, Stephen. And uh, you'll see where it's indicated that Emma was going to read. Uh, Derek Thomas MP is with us with a constituency member, Chris Rodder, you're very welcome. And Andrew Rossendale MP, who is here to give a tribute to the late Sir David Amos. And we're going to do that just before the readings. And we're so glad that you're able to be with us and share those words uh, in a little while. Uh, Tricia Hillis is also with us, chaplain to the Speaker of the House of Commons and Canon of Westminster, and will be participating in the service. We're also delighted to have friends from the House of Lords. Uh, I know that Lord Leslie Griffiths is with us, and we're delighted about that, and Oliver Burton and his wife, uh, Margaret. That's Leslie's wife, Margaret, as well. We're delighted to have the President and Vice President of the Methodist Conference with us, uh, the Reverend Sonia Hicks and Mrs. Barbara Easton. Uh, we're thrilled that Barbara is with us. She's not in the programme because we were told her train was delayed or could have been delayed and she wouldn't be able to be here, but suddenly it wasn't and she is. So she's taking part in the service, which we're thrilled about. So a very warm welcome to you both. Also attending the service, we have members of the Connectional Methodist team. We have our secretary of conference and assistant secretary here, our chairs of the London district, and staff from Methodist Central Hall Westminster, and church members as well. Now, I'm going to explain how we will receive Holy Communion a little later in the service, in case there are any latecomers. Uh, there will be a retiring offering uh, if you wish to uh, make an offering, and there will also be free refreshments that will be served in the crush hall after the service if you'd like to partake. For the most part, the service will proceed unannounced, uh, but we will be standing for the hymns, the reading of the gospel, and the great prayer of thanksgiving, but we'll sit for the other readings and prayers. Let us be silent and conscious that we were in the presence of God before we arrived. But may we be particularly conscious of his presence in this place. We stand to sing, love divine, all loves excelling.
glory to the Father, the God of love, who created us, who continually preserves and sustains us, who has loved us with an everlasting love and given us the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Blessed be God forever. Glory to Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who though he was rich, yet for our sake became poor. And when he was tested in every way, as we are, yet without sin, who proclaimed the good news of the kingdom and was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, who was raised from the dead and is alive forever, and has opened the kingdom of heaven to all who trust in him, who is seated at God's right hand in glory and will come to be our judge. Blessed be God forever. Glory to the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, by whom we are born into the family of God and made members of the body of Christ, whose witness confirms us whose wisdom teaches us, whose power enables us, who will do for us more than we can ask or think. Blessed be God forever. To the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be praise and glory forever. Amen. God of grace, through the mediation of your Son, you call us into a new covenant. Help us, therefore, to draw near with faith and join ourselves in a perpetual covenant with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Reverend Miles, for inviting me to speak in this magnificent surroundings here in the Methodist Central Hall. I wish I wasn't here to give this brief speech today, these few words. I'd much rather be here participating and celebrating with you for this wonderful annual occasion. But I'm here because in the last few months we lost a magnificent friend and colleague in Sir David Amos. You've heard much about David in the last few weeks and months since he was so cruelly taken from us on that sad day in October. But I want to tell you a few other things about my friend Sir David. He was no ordinary politician. He was no ordinary member of parliament. He was very special as a person, as a constituent MP, but as a colleague in the House of Commons. We have many colleagues that we make friends with, but often they are ships that pass by. David was not one of those. He was a true friend. He was somebody who, if he made friends with you, he was a friend of yours for life. And I knew him and was very privileged to know him for 40 years. We had much in common. We were both members of parliament in Essex. Uh, we came from similar backgrounds and we shared very similar values. And although he was a member of parliament long before me, I was elected in 2001, he was elected in 1983. I knew him in all those years and when I became a member of parliament, he was the first to take me under his wing and guide me, advise me, and keep me going in the right direction as a new MP. And all MPs need someone to look after them when they first get elected. And he was the one person that I could always depend on. He was the person that would come and knock on my door in the evening and say, what are you doing, Andrew? Let's go out for dinner. He would be the person to call me and say, come with me to this event or come on this visit abroad. Often I would go with him to different parts of the world in different 
capacities. But above all, he was the person that was always there when I needed help, advice and friendship. And I miss him and I know that my colleagues here today also miss him very much. But more, I would say, his family, Julia, his wife and his f five children, uh, together with his constituents who he served so well for so long, both in Basildon and in Southend West. He was an exemplary member of parliament. He was dedicated to the job of serving the people that elected him. And he would put politics aside and work with colleagues across the house. Nothing, no issue was too small for David to deal with. Uh, no person was unimportant to him. He would be there for everyone. And he was almost, he almost became a non-political person. He was a, a true human being who genuinely cared about his fellow human beings. And I hope all of us will aspire to be like Sir David Amos. And I stand here in great sadness at losing such a dear friend. But also, I say to you all, we celebrate. We really do celebrate having known him and have shared part of his life and the things that the experiences we all had with David, the funny moments, and he was very funny. He said many funny things, and sometimes I have to say slightly tricky things, he would say, and inappropriate things, but my goodness, did he have a wonderful sense of humour. He was a, a tremendous person to know, and I'm very privileged to have known him for so long. I'm particularly sad that he's not here now, because I know David, being a a Christian, a true believer in the Christian faith of this country. He was, in fact, a Roman Catholic, as you all know, but he was, he was there for all denominations and all religions. He was a man of faith, a man of great morality, a man with a compass in his life, both morally and politically, but also a wonderful father, husband, and a fantastic family that he dedicated his life to bringing up and looking after. And I, I think all of us who knew him will never get over the, the terrible loss that we've suffered uh, in losing uh, Sir David Amos this year. He would have been celebrating the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. He was an incredible royalist. Uh, he loved the Queen. He loved anything to do with our country and the royal family. And I'm just sad he's not here to celebrate this momentous year in our history as we celebrate Her Majesty's 70 years as our Sovereign and Head of State. So I just thank, I just th thank him for being there for me. And whilst I'm deeply sad, um, I'll never forget him. And I pray that today he is in a better place uh, and pledge to to you and to everyone that his memory will live on uh, because it will. He was a very special human being and I was proud to have been his friend. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you, uh, Andrew, and also read some words from Cat Smith. I'm sorry that I'm not well enough to join you this evening. Since I was elected in 2015, I've never missed our annual Methodist Covenant service. But the effects of COVID have left me struggling. I hope to be with you again next year. I'm particularly sad to miss Andrew's tribute to our dear friend, David Amos. David was taken from us in a horrific and violent way, but I hope we will remember his kindness and humanity and the warmth we felt across the house. David's Christian faith meant that regardless of what colour rosette either of us wore, we always had something far bigger than politics that gave us common ground. Andrew shares that faith, and I'm confident that you will all feel that you get to know David through Andrew's words. And Andrew, I hope you enjoy your Methodist Covenant service and it gives you a renewed confidence in living out your Christian faith too. God bless you and thank you to everyone who makes this wonderful annual service happen. We will be 
remembering um, David's family and our prayers and other MPs who have passed away. But I wonder if we could just stand for a moment of quiet before we have our first reading. Remembering particularly that it was in a Methodist church that Sir David lost his life. Almighty God, we thank you for all who give their lives in service of others. We thank you for Sir David. We thank you for his Christian faith. And though his earthly life be taken away, we thank you for that eternal life that he has secure in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. We give thanks for him and for all the benefits of our faith in Christ. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from the book of Deuteronomy. From chapter 29, starting at verse 10. You stand assembled today, all of you, before the Lord your God, the leaders of your tribes, your elders and your officials, all the men of Israel, your children, your women, and the aliens who are in your camp, both those who cut your wood and those who draw your water, to enter into the covenant of the Lord your God, sworn by an oath which the Lord your God is making with you today in order that he may establish you today as his people and that he may be your God as he promised you and as he swore to your ancestors to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. I am making this covenant sworn by an oath not only with you who stand here with us today before the Lord our God but also with those who are not here with us today. Thank you. It's always a great honour to read scripture, especially here with you this evening. The reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with your ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbours or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sons, their sins no more. Thanks be to God. The third reading today is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 14, verses 22 to 25. Hear the Gospel of Christ. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Holy God, break your word as bread for the feeding of our souls. And may the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Friends, I want to say something tonight about freedom and about public service. And what I say will of necessity be incomplete, of course. But before we get to those rather earnest reflections about freedom and about service, I want to pause and take stock of where we are tonight as we come to renew our covenant. Because in this congregation, we do not need to look far to find those who are indeed very high and exalted, those who have been brought low, those who are full and those who are empty, right here, now tonight, as we gather to offer ourselves again to God. And we are people with full knowledge of the world as it is this January in the widening gyre where things do fall apart. We are intimately aware of the danger of this moment in our history, of the unfinished work of justice, of our own failures, let alone those of others. It does seem at times that the best lack all conviction and that the worst are full of passionate intensity. And I hope we are here tonight because in humility, once all is stripped away, we are left with hope in Christ when all is stripped away by tragedy, by violent attack, by setbacks, by the condition of our history, or just by a heartbreak in a cause of justice for which we have worked many years and we see now seeming to slip through our fingers. When all is stripped away, we are left with hope in Christ. And friends, it is an audacious thing, an act of resistance you do together and to make these prayers tonight, knowing what you do of the way that power works in our world, of the way money works, how fear and anger among people are farmed as a cash crop, sown, cultivated, and sold to the highest bidder. Friends, right now we are in a moment, a public moment of intake and breath, a moment in our public life which is pregnant with the possibility for good and for evil. Our actions matter. Our choices matter. So, to freedom and then to service. Freedom first because there are those who balk at this covenant prayer rightly because it feels like the antithesis of freedom. Is this not a dangerous prayer to make if it might confuse abuse by the world with service to God or if it might quieten our conscience seeming to authorize a toleration of injustice? This is reasonable concern. Covenant is the antithesis of rights, certainly, not an abrogation of rights, the big ones of which are a God-given legal reality, hard-won and worth protecting. 
It's just that this prayer is about something else, beyond the rights kind of freedom. Never reduce Christian freedom to a set of rights, righteous though they are, that we defend as part of our local and shared international commitment to justice. Covenant with God, reaffirmed in this prayer, offers us something different, something more. And covenant reminds me, as I choose to abandon myself in God, in Jesus Christ, that I'm choosing at the same time not to abandon myself thoughtlessly to the conditions the world gives my life, be they personal or political. This prayer in itself in it, in it, the self-abandonment it offers, offers us freedom from the sometimes toxic hold of our history, our cultures, our sin. Covenant with God offers us freedom from our fear of the cost of change, from our complicity, from our pride, from our power-seeking. This prayer defends us from a kind of toxic paralysis, from being so transfixed by the complexity of problems that we confront as to be able to do nothing because perhaps we cannot do everything. It frees us. And in this world today, this covenant is deeply personal, yet not private. It protects us, you and me, and our public life from manipulation by any who would seek to use our collective fear, stoke it, to control us. And when I say us, friends, I'm meaning the big us in Deuteronomy, not the little us that manages to make it to church or another house of faith week by week. If you control what I want, you have no need to restrict my choice with law. If you control the person whom I fear, what makes me angry, what I pay attention to, if you control our collective outrage, you have a powerful engine to manufacture a tool of extraordinarily oppressive power and call it the will of the people. This is something different to democratic freedom, di different certainly from a just society. It is a threat to human rights and to Christian freedom both. Friends, choose with me tonight against obedience to the reductive power of the world that says we are worth what we can buy or sell. Because resisting these powers does not happen by accident. It takes the kind of repeated act of will that we call holiness, repeated again and again over time and together. Now, These are earnest words, but I'm talking about down-to-earth stuff. I look at the algorithms that drive my social media feed, uh, and they tell me each day what I should buy. You know the adverts that are chosen just for us, and they're meant to sound as if it's a favorite friend who's giving you a little nudge. It's going to make your life better. And friends, i got to say, I go for them hook, line, and sinker. They saw me coming. <laughs> Um, last year, I started getting in my feed suggestions about supplements to help my perimenopausal mood swings or to regain the dew-like complexion of my youth. If I ever had one, what fun. <laughs> uh, recently, it's all pants. You know, it's big pants, small pants, pants that show, pants that don't. I'm not going to ask what's in your feed. But listen to what those algorithms think of you. If I ever wonder what I should be worried about, my social media feed is right there to remind me. <laughs> and not just in my little personal life, but in my politics as well. I'm not talking in abstracts when I say that our outrage is being treated like a cash crop, seeded, cultivated, harvested, and sold to the highest bidder. Do you want to be chattel? Because I do not. The covenant we make tonight clarifies where our allegiance lies. It takes away the powerful pull to be conformed to this world. I'll say again, covenant reminds me as I choose to abandon myself 
to God in Jesus Christ, that I'm choosing at the same time not to abandon myself thoughtlessly to the conditions the world gives my life, be they personal or political. Praise God. I'm not just the sum of the tags an algorithm assigns me as a consumer of a particular gender or skin color. I'm not just defined by whom I love or my nationality or my age. This is freedom. These interests, these tags, all these things about who I am, strong though they may be, will never be allowed to contain, to constrain my compassion as I abandon myself to God. In covenant with God, I am no longer bound by my self-interest, nor by what is realistic to hope for politically, globally. Praise God, this is joyful freedom. And this is not to speak of Christian faith present in public life as just another influencer trying to shout louder and have greater impact. God hope we do. This is not Christian faith reduced only to a system of ethics or a way of life, but Christian faith redefining the rules of the game. And in this moment where so much feels poised on an edge when peace is so tenuous, freedom is still worth sacrifice. It is worth defending. And Christian freedom is still worth the work to live in the tension of being in a world unfinished and not to retreat. This is freedom, to live in a world that will harm us when we challenge its power, where we seek not so much to become appropriate, but to become Christ-like. So from thoughts of freedom to thoughts about service because we who have received the one in Jesus Christ will be committed to the other. We are committed to public service not because we are good, though it must be said some of us are very good indeed, (laughs) but because Jesus came into the world and gave up power, gave up self to serve. Our God has flesh in the game. And we are committed to public service because when all else is stripped away and we are left with hope, we remember that God's grace extends beyond the end of life. Friends, the end of our lives will come, but our purpose, our hope, it not only outlives us, it is eternal. Now, on our watch, children are hungry. Folk are without homes right now tonight. On our watch, There are young people tonight who feel safer to carry a knife than not. On our watch, rich people stand a decent chance of negotiating a legal welcome as refugees in any one of a number of countries, and poor much less. Name for yourself the unfinished work you see ahead. Name the challenges which are so complex, so entrenched, that you cannot begin to think how to serve righteousness in them. Name them, and then begin, and begin again, and begin again, over time and together. What we do matters, and in covenant with God, we become free of any constraint that would contain our aspirations for public service that would set limits on our expectations of justice. Covenant makes service today possible. Hope makes service joyful. And the covenant prayer is made by individuals together and on one another's behalf, yet it's not a private prayer. Deuteronomy reminded us of that. And it's not a prayer that will excuse us from the responsibility of power. Jeremiah knocked that one on the head. (laughs) Nor will it let us get away with an easy conscience when we collude with evil and excuse it as political realism. I'm only talking about myself. Thank you, Paul. This prayer clarifies where our obedience lies among the competing claims of any moment or situation. And our service in joy is to the one who offered himself in bread and wine, offered his body, his blood, 
for the salvation of all. Covenant reminds me, I'll say it one more time, as I choose to abandon myself to God in Jesus Christ, I'm choosing at the same time not to abandon myself thoughtlessly to the condition that the world gives my life, be it personal or political. As God abandons God's self in love for us, freedom, service. It may be an unfinished walk, but by God, we are walking. So as he took bread and wine and blessed and broke and shared his body and blood, my prayer is that tonight God should take us again. Set us free to serve. Make us humble, good-humored, persistent, forbearing, competent, hopeful when all else is stripped away. And thank God for each one of you beautiful people. God protect and defend you. God bless you with good sense and with laughter. God bless you with purpose. Resist evil. God bless you with strength in service, with freedom, and with a vaulting ambition for Christ that cannot be ever satisfied. Glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. And so, in the context of the readings from Scripture which we have heard, and of Jen's powerful words, we move to make our covenant. God made a covenant with the people of Israel, calling them to be a holy nation, chosen to bear witness to God's steadfast love by finding delight in the law. The covenant was renewed in Jesus Christ our Lord, in his life, work, death and resurrection. In him, all people may be set free from sin and its power and united in love and obedience. In this covenant, God promises us new life in Christ. For our part, we promise to live no longer for ourselves, but for God. We meet, therefore, as generations have met before us, to renew the covenants which bound them and binds us to God. Let us then seek forgiveness for the sin by which we have denied God's claim upon us. Let us pray. God of mercy, hear us as we confess our sins. For the sin that has made us slow to learn from Christ, reluctant to follow him, and afraid to bear the cross. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. For the sin that has caused the poverty of our worship, the formality and selfishness of our prayers, our neglect of fellowship and the means of grace, and our hesitating witness for Christ. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. For the sin that has led us to misuse your gifts, evade our responsibilities and fail to be good stewards of your creation. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. For the sin that has made us unwilling to overcome evil with good, tolerant of injustice, quick to condemn and selfish in sharing your love with others. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on me, O God, in your constant love. In the fullness of your mercy, blot out my offences. Wash away all my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Give me the joy of your help again, and strengthen me with a willing spirit. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, to all who truly repent, this is his gracious word. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. Beloved in Christ, let us again claim for ourselves the covenant which God has made with his people and take upon us the yoke of Christ. This means that we are content that he appoint us our place and work and that he himself be our reward. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honor, others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and material interests, others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. In others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ who strengthens us. Therefore, let us make this covenant of God our own. Let us give ourselves to God, trusting in God's promises and relying on God's grace. Lord God, Holy Father, since you have called us through Christ to share in this gracious covenant, we take upon ourselves with joy 
the yoke of obedience, and for love of you, engage ourselves to seek and do your perfect will. We are no longer our own, but yours. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will, rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant now made on earth let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. As we have entered this covenant not for ourselves alone, but as God's servants and witnesses, let us pray for the church and for the world. Loving God, hear us as we pray for your holy Catholic church. Make us all one that the world may believe. Inspire and lead all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Establish justice and peace among all people. Have compassion on all who suffer from any sickness, grief, or trouble. Deliver them from their distress. We praise you for all your sins who have entered your eternal glory. Bring us all to share in the heavenly kingdom. Let us pray in silence for our own needs and for those of others. Merciful God, we offer a prayer for peace and healing for all nations. Be with all who have suffered and continue to suffer due to the pandemic. Heal us from the wounds of inequality, discrimination, racial and other forms of injustice. Where there is hatred, let there be love. Where there is conflict, let there be peace. We pray for strength and endurance for all frontline and essential workers. Lord God, be a friend and a companion to the lonely, the marginalized, the oppressed, and suppressed. Grant us the grace to serve one another, to care for one another, to share with one another. For we ask these prayers in and through the matchless name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The prayer offered each day in the commons as the house sits. Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, Grant to our Queen and her government, to members of Parliament, and all in positions of responsibility, the guidance of your Spirit. May they never lead the nation wrongly, through love of power, desire to please, or unworthy ideals, but laying aside all private interests and prejudices, keep in mind their responsibility, to seek to improve the condition of all humankind. So may your kingdom come and your name be hallowed. Amen. 
O God of loving and tender grace, as we begin this new year, we pray for colleagues across the parliamentary estate, and we remember with a special gratitude those who have died in recent months, whose absence is keenly felt. Among them, Dame Cheryl Gillen, James Brokenshire, Sir David Amos, Jack Dromey, Lord Hughes of Woodside, Lord Mackenzie of Luton, Viscount Simon, Lord Smith of Lee, Baroness O'Caithlin, Lord Judd, Lord Greaves, and Lord Fraser of Corrigarth. We entrust them to your mercy and enfolding love. And as we have been united in honouring them, may such respect always be the tenor of our relating to one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord our God, you have helped us by your grace to make these prayers, and you have promised through Christ our Lord that when two or three agree in his name, you will grant what they ask. Answer now your servants' prayers according to their needs. In this world, grant that we may truly know you, and in the world to come, graciously give us life eternal. Through <coughs> Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Will you all please stand? The Lord has made an everlasting covenant of peace with his people. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks. God our Father, fountain of goodness, creator of all that is, you have made us in your image. You have given us life and reason and love for one another, setting in our hearts a hunger for you. In darkness you are our light in adversity and temptation, our strength. You bear patiently with our folly and sin, granting us your law to guide us and your prophets to renew our faith. 
In the fullness of time, you came to us in love and mercy. In Jesus Christ, your living word, full of grace and truth. He lived among us, declaring your forgiveness and revealing your wisdom in works of mercy and in his word of power. For us, he suffered and died upon the cross. By death, destroying death. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. Through him you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your people, gathered together in every time and place to glorify your holy name. With them and all the company of heaven, we join in the unending hymn of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, pour out your spirit that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Lord, we obey his command. With this bread and this cup, by which we recall his death and resurrection, the source of our life and salvation, grant that we who share in this holy sacrament may be united by your spirit and grow into perfect love. Bring us with those who have done your will in every age into the light of your presence and the joy of your kingdom. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we worship you in songs of everlasting praise, blessing and honor and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. We say together the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The things of God for God's holy people.
I am the bread of life. Those who come to me shall not hunger, and those who believe in me shall never thirst. Draw near with faith.
Let us pray. Faithful God, with these holy gifts, you have fed and strengthened us in Jesus Christ, your Son. Guide us on our way that with all your faithful people we may come to share the feast of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name, in the name of Christ. Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.